So we'll start off with uh, the president of PSSI India. We'll start off icon day one with uh, the president of uh, PSSI India, Mr. Anand Pillai, who will be giving out the KG award and introducing our award winner here. Morning, everyone. How are you today? Feeling great and uh, kicked up about PyCon India? Okay, warm welcome to everyone and you know, uh, welcome to the seventh edition of PyCon India 2015. Uh, so when we you know, started this off in 2009 as a fully volunteer driven uh, you know, conference, could never imagine that uh, we will be doing this for you know, after seven years because it was pretty ad hoc and uh, kind of uh, uh, came out of discussions in the, in the mailing list, but I'm pretty happy to see that, you know, that spirit has continued and uh, uh, the people who kind of uh, started that uh, seven years back. Now we have become a little bit older, people including me and Weiser hopefully. Uh, now we have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, younger people, the younger generation coming in, taking care of the the conference and it is still completely volunteer driven. So big hand to all the PyCon India volunteers who made this happen. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, today we have uh, with us uh, two of our uh, distinguished uh, guests, Dr. Ajit Kumar and uh, Mr. Nicola Stolarvi. Uh, Ajit Kumar is the, our keynote speaker for today. A very warm welcome to him. Uh, we also have another distinguished guest, uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar, who is our Kenneth Gonsalves Award winner of, for uh, 2015. So welcome uh, all of you to the PyCon India. Uh, before we start the proceedings, I just thought I'll share uh, you know, a few thoughts about uh, and uh, some statistics maybe you know, uh, to bore you a bit so that, right? we have an idea of what has been happening behind the scenes. Uh, this year, we had 1,560 registrations, the highest so far in PyCon India history. Uh, you know, the number of delegates, number of people who are attending this, they represent nearly 550 different organizations. I'll tell you how we arrived at all these stats. We used a Python package, so. <laughs> okay, and some of you must have guessed what that is, yeah. Um, so this time we have 50% uh, retention, which is actually a record. So 50% of people who visited last year have come back this year. So the rest 50% are new, new, you know, new faces. Welcome to all the new faces. Uh, we have a much higher participation of uh, you know women this year. It is uh, up by five percent, if I am right, and I think it is uh, this year it is eighteen percent of the total you know total participation. Uh, this year we have introduced new new initiatives like uh, childcare uh, in order to uh, kind of uh, facilitate the women participation. Uh, because uh, you know, last year uh, the stats told us that most of the women are you know who want to attend. They had the main problem is basically the, with the family and bringing kids. So we have taken care of that this year. We had a dev sprint uh, for the first time in PyCon India. Uh, you know that was yesterday. It, it happened. So a lot of new initiatives. Uh, you know, uh, completely uh, different conference. So welcome you all once more. Uh, our next agenda is to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Vijay, who is the PyCon uh, KG Award winner for this year. Big hand to Mr. Vijay. So Mr. Vijay has uh, embedded software developer and trainer at Xilogic Systems. So apart from developing Python-based embedded systems uh, based on Telit, he is a big community contributor uh, for uh, Python. He kind of uh, kicked off the GNU Linux user group of Trichy back in 2001 when he was an undergrad there. Since then, he has been actively involved in helping to organize meetups, workshops, demos, and conferences. 
he got associated with Chennai Pi in 2010, the Chennai Python Users Group. And since then, he has um, kind of accelerated the group and, uh, uh, you know, he has rapidly expanded the quality of the meetups and the diversity of the people attending it. So uh, if you go to chennaipi.org, which I think is uh, the homepage, you will find that all the meetups are well documented and the minutes are all there along with the photos for people to see. It's a pretty interesting group. So I invite Vijay to come on stage and accept the the KG Award uh, certificate and a cash award for 40,000 rupees. Uh, requesting Vijay to speak a few words. Thank you, Anand. Um, it's an honor to receive the uh, Kenneth Gonzalez Award. Uh, and I would like to thank the uh, uh, Indian Python community and uh, the PSI for recognizing my work and uh, um, selecting me for this award. Um, for the past uh, few years, my focus has been on running Chennai Pi and promoting Python by running uh, meetups, uh, professional quality meetups. Um, all this would not have been possible with the support of the community at Chennai. I'd like to thank all the people uh, in the Chennai Python user group uh, for contributing to the development of Chennai Pi. Um, Um, any uh, volunteer work, there are lots of volunteers over here, any volunteer work that you do uh, cannot be done without eating into your, the other work time and uh, uh, your family time. So I would thank my, uh, uh, my company, parent company, Zylogic Systems, and my family members uh, for their support and encouragement. Um, and. Um, Anand wanted me to talk something about uh, what we have been doing in Chennai, uh, ch Python user group. Um, so, uh, just a few words uh, uh, before I wind up. So, um, I uh, inherited the uh, um, uh, role of coordinating the uh, Chennai Python user group after uh, the previous uh, um, coordinators of the uh, Chennai Python user group actually uh, moved away. And um, uh, initially, we were running it uh, like yet another user group. But then at one point, I decided, OK, it's, uh, it's, it's not going to work this way. Whatever we have to do, we have to do it in the best way possible. Do it with utmost uh, care and sincerity. So let's do it and take it to the next level. And uh, um, since then, uh, we have been uh, trying to do the uh, uh, activities in uh, Chennai Pi in a big way. And uh, uh, we run every meetup as if it were a mini or micro conference. So that's the uh, care we take in running each uh, meetup. Um, so, um, yeah. If you want uh, to talk more about this, uh, I, we have an open space uh, discussion that's uh, set up for uh, uh, discussing Python community activities. Um, we'll probably meet over there and discuss more in detail. Um, so uh, thanks, everybody, for this award. And I'm sure that uh, we'll uh, take Chennai Pi and promoting Python to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay, for that uh, brief uh, note. Um, let me uh, give a big hand to uh, Dr. Ajit Kumar, our keynote speaker for today, uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Ajit to the stage. And Good morning, everybody. First of all, let me thank the organizers for calling me for this. And I also congratulate Vijay for the award. See, generally, what happens is when people are working very well and doing some cutting edge contributions, then they are invited to you know, present papers. And after that stage, 
when you are not doing something substantial, then you give a general talk, right? That's when you grow old. <laughs> so that's my role today. And about myself, I've been using Python and somewhat fascinated and I've been trying to do the job of a postman most of the time, take the Python development, taking it to schools and colleges and mostly focusing on science education because that is where I make a living. So I'll just talk about, everyone knows about the history of computer education. It all started with the proliferation of IBM PCs, the clones basically, IBM PC clones somewhere started in 83. And in 90, we had the multimedia PCs opening another avenue, a lot of educational software came. And initially, it was like learning something new, that was the machine itself was new. So teaching computers means learning the operating system, the concept of files, directory, most of the things didn't really have a use in itself, but also learning the technology. And MS-DOS was the OS. And we had op applications like, I, I don't think many of you have seen it, WordStar and some Lotus 1, 2, 3, spreadsheet and other things. And this condition, my first exposure with some, a group of school students, it was in 97. It was in a vacation after the, you know, 10th standard exams. We had some 100 students. In groups, we trained them. And what I noticed was, after two, three weeks, you know, several sessions, they learned the basics and they also were introduced to basic programming. That time basic language was part of it. And the students were, I mean, I was quite surprised. They were very quickly catching up with the logic, say drawing circles or maybe writing a program for writing a multiplication table or such things. So I had a feeling, okay, things were going in the right direction because this is a useful tool. Then things changed for the worse. It's my personal view. Office software is branded as educational software, it started creeping in. I'll give you a demo. Suppose you want to teach, I want to teach you the number system, one, two, three, four. So this is a magic, good way of doing it. See, one, right? This is how you teach, using PowerPoint. <laughs> I have a strong doubt these programmers are inspired by something else. It comes from here, there anyway, don't. So, then we became the victims of blotware. And I am myself a personal, I'm personally I am a victim of that. In 95, I had a 386 machine. And the only word processing I did was re, you know, replying to communications come from other people. They come as dot .doc files. What happened is, this I, I remember clearly, then I got the message when I tried to open the file. This required the next version of that particular software to read that document. So that is all, it's like pre-planned. So then I bought the next version of that office package. Tried to install it, it told it needs the higher version of the operating system, that is Windows 95. <laughs> anyway, I was working in a rich organization, spending public money, so it was no issue. You have to write an indent with a signature, buy that. Then I started installing that next OS, it told it needs a 486, not a 386. <laughs> Total cost was around 1.2 lakhs or something. And I still have not figured out why I had to spend that money. So it was not, I was not alone. The entire thing was driven to, you know, more and more powerful hardware. And all we were doing is word processing and PowerPoint presentation, I would normally say powerless and pointless things. And this somewhere, and in between there are some good multimedia programs of course, but mostly they were mimicking a TV. But here, what is the relevance of Python? What we have to do is probably we have to really define what is the role of computers in education. It should be taught for enhancing the quality of education, not something just to introduce something new. We should talk about computer-aided education, not just teaching computers, right? It should be a tool to learn core subjects. Suppose we go with that concept. Say Python, I am just, see, there are enormous number of applications I am not even aware of, Python, say, web-based things. But here in science, actually, we use, say, applied mathematics. There are a lot of things that whatever shown in that yellow, I take some 
special interest that is experimental data acquisition and control. You connect it, it to hardware and do real experiments. So these are Python's basic capabilities and suppose if you take it to lowest levels, schools. Schools we teach the basic physics, this everyone knows that S is equal to half u t square, this linear motion and equations. And textbooks, if you go through that, you will find the equations and the graphs printed. It is a matter of writing two or three lines of Python code. You really understand how that graphs are coming and you can change the parameters. And it gives a better understanding to the subject which you are learning, whether it is mathematics, physics, chemistry or anything. And on this front, when I was trying to look for resources, what I find is, a lot of good programs in vPython and other things, simulations are there on the net and a lot of material to teach Python, but I did not find much material which is only say 10 or 20 lines of code that will, you know, help you to learn the subjects. One probable solution is like in Indian context if I am talking, take all this uh, plus one, plus two or ten standard textbooks and we should try to have Python companion books for that. They will call the exercises, graphs, everything, small, small, I mean, I mean the upper limit of the code should be something 15 or 20 lines, nothing more than that should be accepted because then it becomes a, you know, a programmer's job. I mean without becoming a programmer, how to utilize the power of Python. Slightly advanced level, anyway, this is not that advanced example I have taken. When I go to colleges, people doing MSc or you know even research thing, mostly they need is tools to manipulate big matrices, generate some graphics and do operations like integration difference. This I have taken a, this output you see this from the website I have taken, it is a Chua circuit, it is a special something to study chaos and there is a MATLAB simula simulation output. So I just rewrote a small code in Python, this is the output. So there are areas people use MATLAB and Mathematica they probably need some help to get them into Python and these are also interesting fields. I mean, you can learn something new. Okay, this do not worry, this is where I use at least Python for simple things like this is a accelerator cavity, so small accelerating gaps, you apply voltages and you see how the energy of particle increases. This is a small Python code which there are other programs, complicated things, we use simulation programs, but just to do a quick checking, I still use Python. And now I am coming to an area where I just do something, that is the actual science experiments. There you need a hardware, you have to connect something to, Vijay also work in similar things. That so you have to have external hardware, then you have to have some real time control and data acquisition. So this was achieved by combining a microcontroller with a PC. So you run C program or assembler on a microcontroller, Python on a PC and they communicate. It is a job division actually, all real time jobs go here, all processing and graphics with Python. The strong point of Python and microcontroller both are utilized. So then this already last year it was presented, I will just skip through that. This equipment you can see that on the web the details are there. So this was a first attempt to uh, make a low co you know, very low cost tool available in this area. You can see that some experiment running, this is another one, this is another one. Just drop something to floor and you measure the time of flight. You can see here a metal ball here, it just falls to ground and generates a vibration. The box times it actually, it measures time with a fraction of millisecond resolution. Anyway, this is you can find on xpies.in details are there. And this project actually it is also growing by community support. Last year Google summer of code, I mean uh, Praveen got some support, he did some work. This is another one because that whatever I showed you is a first level and this next one you will find it is hackaday.io, a python powered scientific instrumentation tool. I am not doing it, it is much more complex and more accurate than what I have done. Still uses python and microcontrollers. And in a <laughs> different manner, I call it is next generation software because my son is doing it. So there is no other way it is next generation software. So again, coming back to our main 
topic like how we can utilize Python, what is the advantage. So again we try to define how Python should be used in a school or college environment. The present situation wherever you go, you find conventional PCs maybe taking 100 watts power and in India everywhere you will find a big UPS system and what they do? Word processing, I mean like is our requirements you can see, word processing generally we teach and some programming languages, scientific computation, simulations, so you add anything to that list. Do we really need a power hungry processor for that? What I have seen is if you take a small ARM processor board plus a monitor, most of the jobs are done. And at present Raspberry Pi, the second version seems to be a good candidate for that. I did some tests on that comparing it and it is here. This screen, screenshot is from Raspberry Pi. Here I am running say XPy, it is connected to the hardware and constantly updating the graph, some simulation outputs. And this one I am able to you know use it, this I did not expect as the Maya V, the 3D rendering. That also it is handling reasonably smooth. And this also you can use other RAM boards with 1 GB RAM like QB board, Mars board, there are many options are there. But Raspberry Pi is much better considering their support and you know user base. And also one can think of designing on our own. This is something I did but I failed miserably that is because I did not have maybe that much exposure to that. I made a board with all the specifications, got it fabricated but somehow it did not work. And it was all done using again open source uh, EDA tools like KiCad. You can do schematic, you know PCB layout, everything in that. This is a project probably some good engineers can take up and you know make an ARM board like Raspberry Pi and you know we can have something local also because the component costs are only 10 to 15 dollars. The processors are very cheap nowadays. Now I will just talk some of my personal experiences where I started. As I told you this is the problem when you call old people, huh? let us <laughs> talk about the past. So I got into this, I mean Python via the Linux route, the free, free software. So 94, I was using a DOS before that and that Windows 3.1 was there sitting on those. And I wanted to have a multi-user system which supports networking everything. And that is the point I came across Linux for the first time. And it was available on three floppies and kernel version in 94 was February was less than 1.99 something. And surprisingly everything works very well for me writing a device driver and writing a networking graphics code, everything, a lot of information. So that is where first I realized that community support how important it was. And inspired by that, then I thought if it is very useful for me because running a machine and uh, something which runs 24 hours, 365 days, a particular accelerator, we run on a network of some 20 Linux machines. And so 2001, I thought we will just go to schools and try to push the free software idea. And this project, there are a lot of people, FSF India to went on finally the IT school project of Kerala. It started on proprietary and shifted 100 percent to free software. That time mostly I was promoting terminal servers so that you can have reduced hardware cost. It is no more relevant at the moment because hardware already is cheaper. Then around 2005 got into this computer interface science experiments. One reason is I realized that I cannot write good software so why not combine it with the hardware. Huh? So you have some something different. So made some devices, a Parlport device and it is all called that is the only language uh, that I was comfortable because 87 onwards I was using C. Everything was written in C and the project was released. Then somebody else came and he wrote a paper here in Linux Gazette in 2005. So these five lines, so this you can see the same thing, a relay and metal ball and a loudspeaker measured that time of flight 
and published it here. That's Pramod actually. He registered, I think he didn't come. And that point, I thought I had to learn Python. So that is 2004. So my Python is not very old. And after that, I have been going with Python, mostly to science teachers in colleges and schools. So every year at Inter University Accelerator Center, we conduct training programs for teachers, six day training for physics teachers. So conducted our, around 20 programs like that and also go around and conduct one day workshops that includes actually free software, Linux, Python and XPyce. And also wrote a small book that is for BSc Maths people of Calicut University. This one again, our internal use, since I was using Python for the other thing, I realized that it is useful for my main area of work also. Like you can see these three lines of code capable of controlling or you know monitoring any parameters in our particle accelerator. So there is library hidden. So that helped actually people, the developers of accelerators and users who are not familiar with programming to quickly get something done. And all it goes on the TCP IP network. And this I am not giving much detail. You can get it much better from the web. If you take any field of science, there are a large number of packages available on the web. So I, I thought I'll not really, you know, explain them. And most of them is really actually leveraging on the scientific computation and the graphics capabilities of Python like sci-fi, matplotlib, mayavi and all those things. Now I'll talk about some grievances, right? So I see whether I can get some, you know, support on that. I generally go with a bootable pen drive. So yesterday also I talked to a group of teachers, some 25, 30 people. So they bring their laptops and to run the show, I have to install this XPy software, a lot of, uh, other say matplotlib and scipy, numpy, everything. So the easiest thing is to take a bootable media, a pen drive or a CD, and the participants' uh, laptops we boot from that and run the show. And then I realized now there are some new problems. This is the old one. See, initially in, in 90s, the problem which we faced when going to free software was some network drivers, printers, these things were not available, and there were X window graphics were small. Uh, very slow, and there were less number of ap applications. Even the open office came later, earlier it was star office, and that hurdles in the past, it was over, but the new ones came actually. So now what we are facing is the new hurdles, the cartoon you might have seen. So every time when I go to a place, and people come say, maybe somebody say last year, this last month also I had a program, some 20 people, around 17, 18 laptops, two of them I could not boot because you cannot disable that booth, you know, that secure <laughs> thing. <laughs> that booth is very <laughs> dangerous. So finally, that laptop could not be used. So then I tell them, before you pay your money, at least you make sure that you can run the OS what you want. The other cartoon anyway, you know how you, it makes you secure, right? tie the laces together, you are very safe. And technical support, you know, some type of, some support is very easy to get on the net. See, when I realized all these things, I am having some business ideas. Since all this, if suppose at this rate, when I conduct the training program, the two will become 20, then I will not be able to conduct any training programs, right? So then I thought, yesterday only this slide was added, because after that program, why not enter business? Everybody is entering into business, right? So I thought I'll set up a crockery shop. Forget about the spelling mistake, English not my mother tongue. Huh? So I call it as my crockery shop. So the deal is, you pay the price of a one good ceramic mug, huh, cup. What you get is a disposable plastic cup, and I'll give you a cello tape free. Because when the cup gets torn, you can repair it with cello tape. An investment partner, you told some 500 companies are there, right? So I hope somebody will. <laughs> so, and now you may be thinking nobody will buy that, right? So this idea is no good. For this money, nobody is going to pay that. You are wrong. I 
here at least 100 people I'll find because there are people who pay for an OS and accept a pre-installed with a recovery CD, right? They don't get an installable media so that they can wipe out their hardware and they reinstall it today. So that kind of people are, I'm thinking my potential customers. <laughs> so I, I hope now I have some investment <laughs> partners coming up. So the message is probably we have to keep our freedom. So, so probably I would say I like to emphasize on two points. One is Python gives us a different kind of power in the field of education. That is, you can redefine the requirement and even your hardware requirements are becoming smaller. Think of a lab where you put say some ARM machines like Raspberry Pi say 10 or 20 of them, each cost say 5 plus 15 something like 20 watts and put a big battery and a solar panel. So it's, it's going to be very economic and environment friendly and it will do, I mean, as far as I can see, it can do all your needs, teaching programming or teaching science or any other thing. You don't have to really keep on investing on hardware and that and running all sorts of you know, unwanted software. So that means you can increase the efficiency of the overall system. And another thing is, see Python, why I'm standing here is it's an open source tool. Suppose if there is a VBCon, even if it is much better than Python, probably I wouldn't have come because it's, you know, the technical capability is not the only criteria because you are in an open source environment what you, that is what you prefer, right? So there also we have to see whether we are able to preserve that freedom, like the freedom to buy the hardware you like and the freedom to run the OS of your preference. If, if there is any arm testing, one should realize that. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any audience, uh, any member from the audience who wants to ask something? Uh, anyone who wants to ask? No one? Okay, so there's one candidate. Education, right? Is it prominent in any other countries? I mean, is there any initiative taken by other countries or like we are the first? Okay, see, that way uh, you are talking about this just the Python, it is the uh, Raspberry Pi itself is running worldwide, right? Means uh, every machine is going with Python and the, the stuff which I was talking about that expires kit, that uh, around 25 percent of uh, that has been sold outside India. Mostly in Europe, uh, France uh, is there and Canada and USA. So there is some export market is there. But basically it is not moving that faster because we do not have that kind of marketing. The people who are making it, just entrepreneurs, I mean they are not marketing it really. They are just selling it. So uh, this Python, right, I mean like, uh, is it because just the hardware cost that you are talking about or are there any uh, specific advantages it have in types of? Uh, in education. In learning the, uh, fastening yes. the learning experience. Yes, yes, yes. See, I, I didn't probably, uh, just since you asked that question. Uh, for, just exam for example, maybe MATLAB looks like more tempting to like. Yeah, right, right. Just to store in rather than Python, right? Right. So, so if you ask, uh, let me just see. See, this is the desktop which I put on the bootable pen drive. And I don't normally go with a book. And also there is a small program which is a cord browser. I'll just put it there. And... See, there are small programs learning something. It gives the output here. There are so many other, uh, say, if we talk about science, say, I take physics, say, mechanics, a simple mass and spring problem that we do in the very basic classes. And these sort of things I find Python. So, you see, this only hardly 10 or 20 lines of code which shows you that know how to run that simulation and I don't see any other 
language that you know like Fortran, C or anything they can do it that easily. And MATLAB, of course, the proprietary nature, the cost, everything matters. Oh, I see. So Python, I find for teaching science, it has very good potential at school level, especially the plus two and all, because most of the time what you mug up, like you suppose say you uh, see an equation, a complex equation, uh, when you really see it in action, you get a better idea. See, just, just we'll take a very small thing here. Say here, just one plot, R is equal to cos k theta, right? In Python, it is only four lines of code. It gives a graph like this. Suppose my intention is to explore this equation, its behavior, not learning Python. I make it score as for 0.4. I get it like this. So then you are, see, your intention is to explore the mathematical equation and it looks dull when it is written like this, but when you see the plot, it, it is, you know, it is something different. Say here, another small equation here, I will just run it, it, it uses my RV. My RV takes a bit of time loading. See, this is the same picture you have seen in your chemistry textbooks, right? That P orbital or something in 12 standard or even 10 standard. It's just solving an equation and the function that spherical harmonics display. So all these things, if I try to, or if you want more entertainment, say make, make a fractal. And all these programs are always, you know, I don't write big programs here. It's all maximum, you can do it in 20 lines or something like that. That, that I see as a real, you know, advantage. And if you just these are other animations again, Matplotlib, and you know, this is again a small, you know, study on these Chaos Lorentz systems. And this pe people mostly do these things. I I know who's over working in this area. Most of the people are using MATLAB at the moment. And I'm just think, telling some of them at least, you know, convert it into Python, give it a try. So you are not worried about licensing anymore after that. So this another one is actually is then again, see studying the neurons, you know, some equations you have put and see how this, uh, what the phenomena called amplitude, depth and other, don't ask me too much, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> so, but I just take their equations and try to write the code and uh, tell them to just see whether it, it, it's useful. And this, this I find it's quite easy because this is the actually some of the equations here. So that I think it is true in any field of education. You can, you can easily learn that. Maybe I will end with the, see this, this argument is always there, which language is better. Maybe I will end with a story, which somewhat I believe in. And in our language there is a saying, there is a story. Uh, about that, uh, you must be knowing there is a hermit who had the rat problem in his uh, hermitage. So rat manage, finally somebody asked him, you advise you keep a cat. So cat will catch the uh, mouse and you will be peaceful. He obeyed that, then uh, the problem was you have to feed the cat, my milk is naked, he has to keep a cow for that. Then finally, you know, he finally married and settled as a, <laughs> so his original way of life was lost. Normally I say when a physicist or mathematician, if you are getting into programming, you have to be careful. You should stay with your subject. If you go with C and you will solve the problem, by the time you solve your problem, you have become a programmer rather than a physicist. I mean your focus of attention will drift. But Python, which I have seen, that will not happen because you stay focused on your subject and learning Python, I mean, that effort is very, very minimal. And that's where I prefer, you know, I, that, that's the only, I mean, it's a personal belief probably, I may be wrong. And with that belief only, I just go and tell people, okay, just switch over to Python and start using it. Any other question? Yeah, I have one more question. Yes. Yeah, Python is used to for what? You Yeah, sorry. Yeah, my name is Venkat. I'm just curious to know uh, why Python has been used for uh, developing the YouTube application. 
other than it is uh, open source is there any advantage uh, from technical point of view no that i think some experts here will tell you because that web programming using python i know it is very see it is mo practical. more uh, video intensive application youtube right. as uh, everybody right. knows so that only that somebody who is programming in that you know area can tell why, why it is you know done <laughs> Maybe somebody else can answer anybody? that question. Anand, anyone can answer that question? Yeah, I know my brother was in the Yes. This on? Okay. So I had the same question to him, you know, when I visited there like two years back, which was actually I was attending PyCon US at that time. So the answer was that uh, actual processing is done in C++. And Python is used in the API for from the front end to the back end, okay? Because it uh, it's amazing as a API, you know, language. It's like a glue language, uh, both in terms of if you want to use it as a glue for connecting C to uh, Python. This is what some of the scientific things do. That is one way of using it as a glue language. Another is as an API language. So that's what Python is used for, not for any uh, you know processing. Uh, can we take it offline? We'll, I'm happy to talk about it later. Okay. Any other question? Yeah. So I'll add something to that now since uh, Anand told that. This is what he told is true for all the scientific computers and also. When I talk about all this integration or matrix manipulation done by Python, it's all old Fortran libraries or C libraries, just <laughs> soloed by Python. That is, <laughs> that is the fact. Uh. Um, Mr. Ajit, first of all, uh, fantastic effort, big, uh, you know, hand for that. Uh, I, I just had a couple of questions, one, and maybe one suggestion. One is that, is there a community in trying to help uh, teach Python to kids uh, to, for, you know, learning science and math and stuff like that? Is there a community effort that's either part of Python groups or something else that you are aware of? FOSI, Bombay, IIT Bombay, FOSI group is there. Okay. Prabhu Ramchandran. And it's an active community in the sense yeah. that, be, okay, that's yeah. one. Second thing is that it'll, it'll be great if you can uh, do one open space uh, with people who are, that is probably where you can, you're going to get a lot of help. You mentioned that there are some packages that cannot be marketed and stuff like that. There are also probably a lot of entrepreneurs here who may be interested in getting involved. So my request to you is maybe in open space, you can set up like a 15 minute, 30 minute slot sure. and yeah. we'll be happy to come down and, you know, we can discuss how we can help. After this, we can talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have one more question. So if we see countries like uh, US, uh, UK, France, Australia, and some European countries, uh, most of them are using Python as a primary programming language. Uh, in India, even for engineering students, we are still teaching C language as the primary language. Do you have anything oh, to comment on that? I can only answer in terms of physics, you know, physics. <laughs> Don't take it very seriously. Physics has a concept called inertia. Suppose, see, I cannot push this because it's inertia heavy. But a small laptop I'm able to push, right? India is a big country, you know, we call it a very huge country. And we have huge inertia. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> what <laughs> what So, we don't change fast. Actually, what happened is, Fortran was initially taught in schools and colleges because most of the, if you see the history in the 80s when the computer labs were set up in all universities, it was done by either physics people or uh, math people because there was no computer science as such at that time in 80s. It was Calicut University also enough. So they were comfortable with Fortran. Then industry was more with you know C, C++. So finally, for I'm talking about see, the school education, whatever the CBSC allowed, they put C++. But they never realized that this C++ is as a separate compartment and it never interacted with the other PCM, physics, chemistry, maths. So it was parallel track. And uh, the only reason was those who introduced the language did not have any, you know, aim in mind, just teach students one programming language, maybe in future it will be useful to them, that's all. But with Python, it is the, it's a different thing. You want to see these three things are going, physics, chemistry, maths, or other, whatever. This should support the other three. 
And CBSE finally, they have realized that they higher up and uh, uh, last to last year, uh, now for you know, plus one and plus two, you have an option to take C plus four or Python, but it is, it is an opportunity, but what is really happening is no schools are, it's an option school wise and school can choose this or that. And I have not seen any school actually switching over to Python because they are mainly, again inertia to some extent and they are a bit afraid also who will support. So our Python communities, probably the service we can do is approach these schools and see whether we can give some support and at least pursue them to switch over so that in the long run things will happen. Also tell them Python also has good job opportunities. That is. Thank you. Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, so uh, the thing is that you said uh, Python for education, uh, class 10, 11, 12, you mentioned that uh, physics equations can be translated into programs and you can see the simulation and visualize it and all. So is there any work going on in that field? Like, have you done some? Yeah, I do a little bit, but if you see on the internet, many people are doing it. Like if you take the uh, Python visual, vPython, Scython, there's a lot of simulation, but what I find is, see, programmers have a tendency sometimes, make it too fancy, right? You write a code, it is five lines, it is doing the job, but then we add bells and whistles and make it 100 lines, nobody else understand that. So that is the only <laughs> trouble I am seeing. <laughs> so what we need is, give the core thing, these five lines and tell, you know, students, no, you do whatever you want. So what uh, I was telling is a lot of programs and a lot of literature to teach Python, but we need small fragments, say maybe 10 lines, 50 lines, 5 lines, and just plot an equation. So that at that point, the confidence also is very high. You see, they think, okay, two lines I can easily learn. And one thing that, is, that will vanish is, I know how this, uh, at least to BSc, MSc level, they are teaching C, C++, and students just mug up these, so they know there are 10 programs they have to learn that will be asked in the exam. So they just mug it up, including semicolon and colon and everything. <laughs> and, uh, and Python, the trouble is, there is no semicolon to mug up. <laughs> there is nothing. <laughs> so so that, that's a big uh, disadvantage. Those who want to really mug up something, there's nothing. So I normally, when I give elementary Python talk, I'll tell them, only thing to remember is, if there is a block indentation, before indentation, block a colon. If you can remember that much, somehow you are through, right? I mean, that's what the feeling I got. I also told, I don't have that much experience in Python. It's only 10 year old Python that to force by Pramod. <laughs> uh, one last thing. Uh, so the thing is you said that uh, you are also working with uh, mm, particle accelerators. So I just want to know like uh, which uh, team you are working with and uh, what exactly are the experiments? What kind of experiments are you running? Ah, that I don't know. <laughs> this, <laughs> is this a, okay, Justin. see, oh, I, I tell you, I mean, the, uh, I work in a particle accelerator lab. That was the first lab established for Indian universities. In 1984, it was established because Indian universities did not have a particle accelerator for that. So UGC thought it is better and no university can afford to have it on their own because hundreds of crores investment. So initially we started with a 16 million volt tandem accelerator and that was uh, started uh, in 90, started operating. And then we started working on a superconducting linear accelerators and that is commissioned uh, five years back. Now presently I am involved in another linear accelerator design. So these are basically, we do mostly the design development and maintenance. And see, even that kit, what I was talking about, is a byproduct of this, because I, 87, I got into accelerator control system. There you are having hundreds of parameters interface to computer. Here you reduced into a small box with 10 or 15. Otherwise, the accelerator usage is mainly in nuclear physics, material science, I mean, so pure physics, so fundamental physics only, that is. Yeah, one last question. Anybody has Anybody has any last, any more last questions, right? Uh, one more question on top. <laughs> yeah. Hello? Yeah. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, so I, my question is again, uh, the connectivity in India, meaning uh, spreading the information is much harder than say in US or somewhere where, yeah. you know, internet access is much more accessible. And also you have, I think, educational distribution channels also which are much better probably than in India. 
can we do something on that friend to better the i mean so i guess if can we pro maybe you know do online courses i mean courses that are recorded and maybe then it can be passed on you know just like as you are sharing the pen drive maybe pass on you know pe pen drive with courses of how to go about these things because i think even uh, there's a fundamental problem that is the way things are taught is not from conceptual understanding of things that but from a mugging up point of view how much ever we might try to change that at the lowest level it will still be quite hard to change that attitude so even if we push python it will python will be the new thing that will get mugged up so i feel if we can have a mechanism by which people who are enthusiastic come collect videos and inspirations of you know how it's used in industry also maybe and then you know uh, push it through channels that we have access to you know like yours or other ones i feel that might reach people uh, the right people uh, with the same amount of enthusiasm and which might i think make a slightly better difference i i i would like to know your question your thoughts on the same i think that way if you are looking i think our biggest you see we have to use the infra existing system right so that way the biggest uh, arena is our uh, schools and colleges so you see getting 100 guys together that is the best place and uh, my personal view is at the moment if you can receive talking into very concrete terms if we make a task force all the python enthusiasts and make something concrete okay we will approach 100 schools offer them an initia initiation into python and also convince them how it is going to see that's always i have have been hammering on how it will help other subjects and they know c++ doesn't help teaching other subjects at all and give a little bit of you know hand holding we'll say for a while and then and the bootable media i find it is very useful because if you ask people okay install these that somewhere they get you know lost and then they have a problem but the other one within 2 minutes you are up and running and either a dvd or so actually for c project program chandra also they used to give this sort of you know bootable dvds and now actually pen drives are much more easier so that but we have to approach schools and colleges that that's what my feeling that is where you know the potential customers are sitting uh, thanks a lot for uh, the insightful keynote and the, the anecdotes uh, dr rajit and thanks a lot for your questions uh, if you want to speak to dr rajit further you can you know catch him in the hallway or in the open space so i think uh, thanks a lot okay thank you